rapidly increasing interest rates, impending recession, bank failures, a growing liquidity crisis, and a looming debt ceiling deadline are currently threatening the stability of the global economy. The last few years since the pandemic have been anything but stable, beginning with the Federal Reserve drastically increasing the nation's money supply, adding trillions of new dollars into circulation, before giving way to unprecedented monetary tightening to alleviate inflationary pressures on the economy. In just these short years, we've seen a lot, including a massive U-turn from free and easy money to a series of harsh but necessary interest rate increases that are now threatening to upend the economy. Last year, when inflation was peaking, I made a video speculating about how Pokemon cards and other collectibles would fare in such a market. It really is an unprecedented territory after all, and while we've managed to stave off financial Armageddon since then, I feel like a number of the inevitable side effects of this economic policy whiplash seem to have financial experts and institutions fearing the worst. So, what does the current economic situation mean for Pokemon cards? Are we teetering on the edge of a collectible's doomsday, or are these fears overly alarmist? I'm Pokemon Classics, and I invite you to join me for a conversation about our macroeconomic situation. But first, let's roll the intro. Hey everybody, what's up from Pokemon Classics, reminding you that the classics never go out of style. As mentioned in the intro, the global macroeconomic situation has been looking increasingly bleak in recent months. Not only are we battling an impending recession and a potential liquidity crisis, but we're also juggling a fragile banking system on the verge of collapse, a debt ceiling standoff, and stubbornly high inflation still well above the targeted 2% yearly average. When you factor in the increasing levels of consumer debt and high levels of volatility in traditional investments, it's downright scary. Now, for full disclosure, I'm in no way an economist and have very little experience in the larger financial markets and institutions that drive economic policy making. I don't know what to think about these issues, nor do I want to present myself as some sort of expert providing definitive answers. Rather, I wanted to make this video in an attempt to start a larger conversation and hear from you, my viewers, with your thoughts and perspectives. So let me know down in the comments below. Have interest rates or inflation forced you to adjust your spending habits? Do you see signs of weakness in the global economy? And does the broader economic outlook have any bearing on your personal collecting decisions? Let me know down in the comments below. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to take you back to the beginning and map out how we got here. At the outset of the pandemic, the Federal Reserve, at the direction of Congress and Jerome Powell, took a series of actions to preserve the U.S. economy during prolonged shutdowns. These actions included lowering interest rates to record lows to encourage borrowing and lending, printing and distributing trillions of new dollars of stimulus money to businesses and consumers, and taking on significant amounts of debt through quantitative easing. In total, the Federal Reserve added approximately $6 trillion to the money supply between 2020 and 2022, a number so astronomically big, it's almost impossible to even conceptualize. According to one news article, if you took a trillion $1 bills and laid them end to end, it would stretch 96,906,656 miles. That's more than the distance of the Earth to the Sun. With so much money injected into the economy, along with pandemic shutdowns, everything was reaching record highs. Stocks, cryptocurrencies, real estate, used vehicles, lumber, and of course, collectibles. Perhaps the 2020 explosion of Pokemon cards was less attributable then to Logan Paul and other social media influencers and more attributable to stimulus checks, unemployment boosts, and forbearance of consumer debt payments. Even now, three years later, student loans still haven't resumed payments, and through much of the pandemic, renters and homeowners had options of delaying their payments as well, giving a massive but temporary boost to discretionary spending. Of course, easy money comes with the risk of high inflation, a hidden price we've all been forced to pay over the last couple of years. In fact, according to one study, the average household has been burdened with an additional $433 a month due to inflation, or about $5,200 per year. Obviously, that's not easy on the wallet, and certainly not conducive for discretionary spending on Pokemon cards and other collectibles. In this video, I'd like to explore three emerging factors that further threaten the stability of the broader economy, 
along with their potential impact on Pokemon cards and collectibles. These factors include interest rate hikes, the banking crisis, and the looming debt ceiling deadline. Together, each of these factors play a major role in consumers' discretionary spending habits, or at least they should, and may give us some insight into the future of Pokemon cards. Anyway, buckle up for this one, we're in for a wild ride. The first factor for consideration is the explosion in interest rates and the growing likelihood of a recession. Since the pandemic, the Federal Reserve, led by Jerome Powell, has been forced to face the growing reality of long-term inflation, resulting from the loose monetary policy mentioned earlier. At its peak, inflation readings crossed 9% in 2022, significantly over the targeted 2%, marking some of the most significant inflation readings we've experienced in 50 years. To combat this problem, the Federal Reserve shifted policy last year with an unprecedented series of aggressive interest rate hikes to slow the economy. To date, we've seen 10 consecutive interest rate hikes, raising the benchmark interest rate from 0% all the way up to 5%, the highest it's been in nearly two decades. The point of these rate hikes is to slow the economy by making credit more expensive and therefore less accessible. However, not without some collateral damage to average people. Usually higher interest rates translates to a slowing economy, layoffs, asset devaluations, and significant struggles for those carrying debt with variable rates. For example, most credit cards have seen a sizable increase in APR, making existing debt much more expensive to service. A lot of consumers are already feeling the sting of higher debt payments, and the question is to what degree will this deter the average collector from spending money on non-essential goods and services like Pokemon cards. Well, I'd like to think that most collectors are responsible with their money and avoid carrying large amounts of debt, or worse, taking on new debt to fund collection purchases, the numbers would suggest otherwise. According to new reports, consumer credit card debt has reached record levels already in 2023 and is rapidly increasing. As of May 15th, this total stands at $986 billion, or about $7,279 per cardholder with unpaid balances. And that's only credit card debt. To make matters worse, the average interest rate on credit cards has increased to over 20% from about 16% just last year, the largest annual increase in over 40 years. At some point, consumers will be forced to adjust their spending habits, either by choice to start clawing their way out of debt, or by force as credit card companies begin imposing limits and closing additional lines of credit. Perhaps we're already seeing this. While it may be anecdotal, mainstay companies in the collectible market have already been raising some red flags. Recently, PWCC announced significant personnel layoffs, while PSA has routinely adjusted their pricing structure to account for lower than expected submission volumes. These are just two examples, but it seems that many collectible companies, including the Pokemon company itself, are seeing a rebalancing of consumer demand, due perhaps in part to macroeconomic conditions affecting the average consumer. It's not only consumers affected by the surge in interest rates, we've also seen the banking system caught in the sudden shift in economic policy. You've probably seen news stories discussing the emerging stress on the banking system, including several major bank failures like Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank. But how did we get here? Again, we must turn our attention back to the pandemic. With record cash pouring into savings accounts during the pandemic, banks invested this money into traditionally low-risk assets, such as United States Treasury bonds, real estate loans, and other interest-bearing assets. Now, just to clarify, most people think that banks just hold your deposit in the vault, awaiting your withdrawal. But what they actually do is reinvest your money, giving you a small, and I mean a small fraction of the interest, with the bank keeping the rest for itself as profit. However, when economic conditions get tough and depositors suddenly need their money and make withdrawals in mass, the bank is obligated to pay that money back. And if they don't have that capital on hand, they're forced to sell those interest-bearing assets on the open market, in some cases, at a significant loss. Consider this scenario. Let's say you're a bank and you bought $1 million in long-term bonds with a 10-year maturity at a 1% fixed interest rate. But one year later, identical bonds are being sold at a 4% interest rate. If held to maturity, your bond would pay $1,105,000. But since rates jumped to 4%, 
that same type of bond could be purchased new, yielding $1,486,000. In order to liquidate your bond to repay your depositors, you would need to reprice your bond to make it competitive in the current market, selling it for $619,000 or an almost 40% loss on your initial investment. Now consider that many banks have billions and billions of dollars locked up in these types of assets, and it's no wonder why so many banks are feeling the squeeze right now. But what does that have to do with Pokemon and other collectible markets? Perhaps nothing, but it's also possible that banks respond to this liquidity risk by becoming more selective with their borrowing standards, substantially reducing accessibility of loans to consumers and businesses in order to shore up their cash reserves. In fact, one report by Bloomberg describes how the last few months have seen a record pullback in lending from commercial banks, with the final weeks of March seeing a decline of $105 billion less in lending. This can easily have a domino effect throughout the broader economy, limiting the flow of money and encouraging people to do likewise and conserve their cash. Now, again, it's my hope that most collectors out there are responsible with their money and carefully and strategically using their savings and discretionary income when making purchasing decisions, rather than debt. But the reality is that the tightening of credit conditions may limit purchasing power for a sizable population of collectors out there. More importantly, it may also affect consumer psychology, contributing to a broader sense of fear in the market and discouraging people from making buying decisions that they may, may have otherwise made under more stable conditions. Needless to say, the banking situation is sitting pretty precariously right now, and that negative sentiment, paired with a tightening of capital throughout the financial system, is just another piece of the puzzle. Finally, we have the national debt and the looming debt ceiling deadline to contend with. If you're not familiar with the debt ceiling, the United States spends more money every year than it takes in via income taxes, meaning the rest of the spending needs to be borrowed and repaid with interest, thus expanding the national debt. The national debt, however, has a ceiling, a congressionally defined limit of how much money can be borrowed, and periodically, that ceiling comes close to being reached and the government close to defaulting on some of its obligations. Obviously, a default on national debt would be an unprecedented disaster for the entire global economy. For starters, the United States Treasury bond is generally seen as the safest investment, and the interest rates on these bonds often serve as the benchmark for interest rates on all other forms of lending across the globe. If the United States were to miss a payment to its bondholders, its pristine credit rating would take a hit, and interest rates for everything would skyrocket overnight. Considering the current national debt is almost $32 trillion, a sharp increase in interest rates would make the national debt that much more expensive and unsustainable. In just the last 20 years, the U.S. national debt has already more than doubled, growing from 58.16% of our entire nation's GDP to over 120% of our nation's GDP. Defaulting would result in millions of delayed payments for Social Security recipients, military personnel, and federal workers. Moreover, it would also ensure an immediate and painful recession. It's also possible that some of these negative effects are felt without even defaulting. In 2011, the United States legislator was in a similar deadlock with regards to negotiating a debt ceiling. While the US never missed a payment or ran out of money, the deadline came so close that S&P Global Ratings downgraded the US from a AAA rating down to a AA plus rating, sending some mild shockwaves throughout the global economy. But here's why this could be such a significant problem moving forward. As the principal balance on the debt continues to increase, so does the amount of interest needed to service our minimum debt payments. Now, factor in rising interest rates that are already four to five times greater than they were just a couple years ago, and pretty soon the US government is forced to choose between two equally bad options, make massive cuts to government spending, most likely entitlement programs like Social Security, or legislate massive tax increases on the working class to generate more revenue. Both options will inevitably lead to social opposition and a lower quality of life as citizens are forced to work more hours to maintain their current lifestyles or take on increasing levels of debt themselves. Currently, surveys indicate that 56% of Americans don't have enough savings to cover even a $1,000 emergency. And as mentioned earlier, the average credit card debt has already spiked 
to a record of $7,279 per cardholder. Once again, factor in high inflation for goods and services, exploding interest rates, and the possibility of a larger economic downturn, we may see some significant changes in consumer spending habits. In short, I have no idea what's to come. It's like solving a jigsaw puzzle with half the pieces missing and a blindfold on. Personally though, I'd think that the tightening of liquidity paired with the higher cost of debt and the growing likelihood of a recession would adversely affect the demand for non-essential goods and services like Pokemon cards. And while I have encountered some articles in my research suggesting that high-end collectibles were a better store of value during the Great Recession than most traditional investments were, it's hard to see this being the case for the vast majority of Pokemon cards. On the other hand, this might also be just another blip on the radar, with future collectors looking back on it as a golden buying opportunity after a historic bull run and subsequent overcorrection. However, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not an economist, but I've always believed that there's no point obsessively worrying about that which we cannot control. That kind of life will only consume the joy that we do have until there's none left. For me, I'm going to continue living my life as I always have, trying to be financially responsible, living modestly within my means, while also dedicating my free time and money to the things I love and enjoy doing. After all, life is all about finding a healthy balance, and that balance may look different for every person out there. While I love collecting and believe in Pokemon's long-term viability, I certainly don't have all the answers. So I'd like to reopen the discussion to all of you out there and hear your thoughts about the current state of the economy and how it might affect the collectibles market. Let me know in the comments below, has inflation or interest rates impacted your spending habits? Do you see signs of weakness in the global economy? And does the broader economic outlook have any bearing for you on your collecting decisions? Again, let me know in the comments down below. Anyway guys, that's gonna wrap it up for this one. I'm Pokemon Classics, reminding you that the classics never go out of style. Till next time everyone, live well, have fun. We'll see you all with the next video. Bye everybody.